Let's go ahead and discuss multiprocessors and locking. So part of what we need to do when we have multiple processors that are in interacting with a single amount of memory is to get some idea of what atomic operations there are. Okay, so by atomic operation, we're talking about some operation that's indivisible. So it's in that sense of atomic that we mean that. And by indivisible, we really mean one of two things happens. Either it completely finishes, or it has no effect. So it's all or nothing. We're limited in our atomic operations to loads and stores of single values. Okay, so for example, if we move the value 52 into the memory referred to by the EX register, that will either entirely happen or not happen. So it's not that part of the 32 bits is going to be written and can be seen from other processors. It is all 52 or none of the 52. Now, if we look at, for example, aggregate values, like let's say we have a structure, two of those, and we say something like A equals B, okay? This is going to be copying multiple values, assuming this structure is bigger than 32 bits. So let's say it's some, you know, larger than 32 bit value, then that's going to actually require a sequence of assembly instructions in order to do that. And our atomic operations are single instructions that are moving these 32 bit, bit values. Okay, so multiple uh, CPU instructions are not atomic. We can see from another processor the effect of single instructions. So what do we do if we want to have what look like atomic operations? That is, look like to other processors that a, we have done a sequence of operations and it's either all or nothing on the other multiprocessors. And that's where we get into the lock abstraction. So for locks, what we do is we have something called a lock. And locks have two different operations. We can acquire a lock, and then we can do things, and then we can release the lock. So the idea is we can have multiple processors, let's say, or multiple threads or whatever else we might want, but multiple processors that are executing this, trying to execute this critical section. And our goal is to make sure only one processor executes this critical section at a time, right? Because if we're not careful when x equals x plus one, one process can, let's say, read an old value of x and increment it. A new process can read an old value of x and increment it. Then one writes, then the other writes, and we haven't really gone up by two, let's say. Okay. So what the lock abstraction allows is if multiple threads call acquire, only one actually acquires the lock. And it goes on and runs its critical section. And then when it re runs release, another process that is a call to acquire, then it uh, um, is free to continue running. If you want to protect different data, use different locks. So if you get different critical, critical sections, you set up different locks. And that way you can have independent critical sections that run in parallel. The thing is, the locks are not implicitly tied in, in, in any way, let's say, to the variables that you're trying to manipulate. So here we're trying to manipulate x. It's up to the programmer to go ahead and plan and make sure we have a lock for x. So we might just not call this lock L. We might call this the x lock, for example, and acquire the x lock, do things to x, and then release the x lock. So when do you need the lock? Question number one. So do you have... So do you have two or more threads that touch a memory location? Okay. Where these, are, these have to be threads because these are sharing an address space, right? If we don't share an address space, then we're not really sharing a memory location. So they have to be sharing an address space in some way. Okay. So two or more threads touch it. And second, does at least one thread write to that memory location? All right. If so, you need a lock. 
Now, this is slightly conservative, right? It may be that you have multiple readers and just one writer, that you can arrange, your, you arrange things such that the readers are either reading an old value that the, that the writer had or a new value that the writer has written, and it doesn't matter which one. In that case, it doesn't matter. You, you, uh, you don't need a lock. But in general, this tells you you need a lock. And this could be considered too liberal in some cases. So sometimes you may be talking about an entire data structure, not a single memory location. And you want to ensure that you have a consistency of that uh, in entire data structure. Locks can also inhibit parallelism. The length of time you spend in a critical section can affect your overall speed up, right? The goal is, as you add more and more processors, you can linearly uh, decrease the speed that it takes. So if we take uh, 100 units of time with one processor, our hope is if we have 10 processors, we can take only 10 units of time. And if we have 20 processors, we can take five units of time. But our critical sections are sections that only one processor can be in at a time that can cause others to wait and that can reduce the parallelism. So you have to kind of decide in, in, a, in a lot of ways, what is the granularity of your locking? One large scale granularity, for instance, for kernels with multiprocessors has often been a single big kernel lock. So only one processor can be running inside the kernel at a time. The good news about that is it's easy to do. The bad news is it really reduces parallelism. So the more fine grained locks that you have, normally the better parallelism that you can create. You can also make design changes. So let's say, for instance, you have a linked list uh, of some form of resource. And this is shared among multiple processors. Well, then you would need some sort of a lock to protect this data structures as multiple of the cores are reading and writing to it, updating it. If instead you could somehow break this apart, so that you had these resources broken into per CPU lists. We wouldn't need a lock for this if it was just on CPU zero, ignoring for a second uh, interrupt. And same thing for CPU one. So that's one possibility. Another possibility you can do is, uh, let's say start out with locks per module, okay? So you might have the file system, uh, you might have networking and so on. So to begin with, create locks for those. And the, it's easier to reason about what's going on, reasoning about deadlock, reasoning about invariance, if you have these coarse grained locks. Then measure, okay? Figure out whether there's a problem. Maybe that's just fine for certain modules. And then redesign only if you have to. One important saying, you can't optimize too early. And the way you really wanna read that is, don't make optimizations until you've actually measured. And the reason for that is your intuitions are often wrong about where you program to spend their time. So don't waste your time optimizing and making your code more obtuse until you know you actually need to.